The CEO Roundtable brings together operations professionals at the top of their game to define and explore what it means to be highly effective in a scale-up organization. And what sits at the heart of it is highly curated peer-to-peer roundtables where CEOs talk about things that matter. I absolutely love my roundtable. We've been together for about two years, and without exaggeration, I have made friends for life. To find out more, go to coroundtable.com. That's coroundtable.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Operations Room, a podcast for COOs. I am Brandon Mensinger, joined by my lovely co-host, Bethany Ayers. How are things going, Bethany? I'm well. It's been a tough few weeks with the other death that I may or may not have mentioned on any of the podcasts. So this time was an unexpected death of a teenager. So it has been really hard. And as being a mother, it has hit me sideways. And we're six, seven weeks in. The funeral was last week and it was an intense funeral and it hasn't really given me the closure that I was expecting. But other than that, which has meant that I've just been a bit slower, not as productive as I'd like to be, trying to be really kind to myself, but I am slightly frustrated and as awful as this sounds, a bit resentful that I have taken this death as hard as I have. On a happier note, I am going to cricket tonight. Cricket? Oh my goodness. I know nothing about cricket. Well, I kind of know things about cricket. I feel like when I watch it and people explain the rules to me, it all makes sense. It's quite logical. I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay. And then two days later, if I were asked to explain the rules of cricket, I would just be able to say, leg before wicket, over, batsman. (laughs) And I would have no idea how those things are connected to each other. (laughs) So tonight's a corporate hospitality type thing, and it's called the T20. It's the start of the T20, which is, I think it was 20 overs per team. So it's over very quickly. And an over is, I think it's called an over is the part where you bat. So you're not a cricket person, neither am I. We're talking about cricket for some reason, but they, with the, uh, in a really what, bad the, North American way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We have no idea what we're talking about, but why are you going to cricket again? Because my ex fiance has invited me. And therefore, it's a must-do. That's quite fun, isn't it? Uh, we were technically an ex-fiance. We technically, I had right. a ring and we had a wedding date, but okay. we were 23. So we weren't yeah. really ever going to get married, if we're honest. <laughs> <laughs> it's all young kids, silly, just doing things, getting rings, setting yeah, dates. Exactly. And he's the reason why I'm in the UK. Oh, I met wow. him when I was doing a semester abroad, finished uni in America, and then came over here to pretend to get married. We were together for a couple of years, split up because 23. And he has this like adventuresome life in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and other parts of the world and all this travel. And now he's back in London. And that LinkedIn post that I sent when I left Peak the infamous yeah. LinkedIn post that gave birth to this podcast mm. also prompted him to get back in touch and just say, oh, you look like an interesting <laughs> person now. So I was thinking of something as well. The guests that we have on for this episode, Tony Olvent in particular, I worked at IDC back in 2010 and I was line managed by Tony. And I was only there for a short time, probably about a year and a quarter. But I feel like that short year period, I did good work for for Tony and Friday C in a very short time frame. But it was also very much like, a, know, it's not a sliding door moment, but I guess just like a year period, year and a half uh, from my life where things had shifted quite dramatically. And talking to Tony on the podcast, it kind of brought back some of the memories as to like that time and what had happened at that point in, in my life. And I, you know, I think during our life lessons episode, I kind of touched on some of the stuff. When I had left London at that time, I had broken up with my girlfriend, or she had broken up with me, I suppose. I had left my job. I was unemployed looking for new work, and I was not finding new work, which was very frustrating. And I was overweight. I was eating scones. And when you're sitting there, not working, broken up, brokenhearted, moving house, and you're not in great shape, basically, it all kind of culminated together. And I was like, fuck this. I'm heading back to Canada. I'm done with all of this. And at that point, 
you know, I was 36 years old. I had done probably a full six or seven years of climbing the corporate ladder within one particular company. And I had jumped off that train and I was in the space of trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. And it wasn't quite clear to me. So all this was swirling in my head a little bit. I was moving back to Toronto. And when IDC came up as a job opportunity, it felt like at the time that it was a step backward in my career because at that point I'd been a senior director at Nuance, which was a large corporate company. And, you know, had was managing large teams and multi-million dollar customers and so on. And took this kind of step back role as a mobile analyst working for IDC and Tony back in Toronto. In retrospect, I think it was probably the, the, the best possible decision I could have made. And, you know, I just needed to get my shit together. And that year and a half that I spent there with Tony, it allowed me the time and space to sort through all that and to put myself into the next phase of my life, we want to call it that, which has now led to all of this now, which is, you know, kind of uh, a lot of cool scale of companies and a career that's been fantastic for me. So, so to the previous podcast, I was listening to you, Bethany, talk about your, I don't know, your lament, I guess, in some ways of like, you don't feel neither more happy nor less happy. You make more money, but you spend more money. And the questions are different at this stage in your life. I feel like there's like the next phase ahead of me now. Maybe it's like a 50-year-old thing. I've turned 50 and I'm thinking about my 50s as a decade, recognizing that I'm on the downside of my life, basically. (laughs) (laughs) Yay. I start with death and you end with death. This is like the uplifting preamble. (laughs) Thank you for sharing your life experiences of the IDC or, or what IDC means to you. But you should also possibly mention that you were in the report that we're talking to them about. Yes, yes. I had the good fortune of uh, Tony uh, contacting me uh, a couple of months ago. And he had been forewarning me for quite some time that at some point he'd be writing a report around COs, around tech COs, and then at some point he would reach out to me. So I think in their, their C-suite research that they do, he felt like I was a good spot-specific person to talk more about the scale-up experience to kind of round out their, their set of profiles and their research report. And what jewels of wisdom did you share with them? He had asked me about a couple of things of interest, I guess. Like one is this question of what are the new priorities for COs and how is that evolving over the next five years? So they're trying to get this future orientation of what the CO space is going to look like a little bit and if there's any fundamental changes. And to your point in the report, as it came out, there's really not a lot of change per se. <laughs> <laughs> but the one thing that I did tell him was like, look, I think, and this gets back to what we talked about earlier around storytelling, I think there's a real requirement or a skill, as I characterized it to him, around evangelism, which is, as a COO, you need to be in a position where, outside of the CEO, you are in the second best position to really evangelize for the business in whatever capacity that is required. And it's almost like that storytelling part two skill set of not being the founder, the passionate founder, being able to articulate that in you know wild and wonderful ways, but from a CEO perspective, to be able to create a narrative and execute it in whatever form that's required. Whether again, you're kind of like doing a, a new round of investment for the company, you're being called upon to kind of be that bedrock person to really add credibility to the pitch or to the new investors or new recruits coming to the business where they want to hear not from the founder in terms of the passion around the business, but around how does this business operate? Can I work within this business? And when you think about, you know, some of the questions that candidates now want answers to and having a deeper dive into things that are important to them, they need to have good answers for that. And I think the operations person, given the fact that you're holistic across the business, you can give them well-formulated answers that are a good representation or proxy for the entire business in this case. And that they're going to have a job if they join a startup in a year's time. Yeah. Well, that's always a question, isn't it? I think in this respect, the CEO is the perfect person to answer this. I think if you can do that in a a credible, well-articulated way to give that foundation or stability to that person, having that conversation, I think that's where that kind of comes in. Because I know that some of the founders, when they give that talk track, sometimes people walk away from that feeling more nervous, not less nervous. The second question he put to me was around team structure and the CEO role within that team structure in terms of functional responsibility. But I think from my point of view, the way that I was characterizing it to him was like, look, right now in 2024, as we kind of head over the next couple of years, I think the investment bets that we make, like you said, the CEO is a true partner 
to the finance leader to ensure that we're making good, solid investment bets for the company that make tremendous sense. And the CEO is a central figure in making that happen. And I think we're going to see more of that, not less of that in terms of the CEO playing a strong role in that capacity. The second bit is around the high performance culture, which is what does that mean? How do you make that happen? How does that translate into business? Because when you think about operations within the company, the operations and that connective tissue really is the uh, and the ways of working and the behaviors and how functional teams interact and so on. It is such a critical component to combust, to enable a culture of high performance. And the operator plays a key role to allow that to happen, to, or to foster that to occur. So that was my second bit, which is much more of collaboration with the people leader to make that happen. Interesting, nothing about AI, because if I'm thinking about the biggest changes in businesses in the next five years, AI for me is the top of that agenda. I think you're absolutely right. When you think about their report that they produce, they called it the classic digital transformation as being the single most important thing that needs to occur in 2024, according to their CEO study that they did. Also, I think it's interesting that digital transformation, I think, since digital transformation was created has been at the top of priority lists, but it's not always been that interesting. The PC was a huge digital transformation. Then the internet was big. Unless you were a mobile business, mobile wasn't huge, really, in terms of changing the way people work. I think, I mean, I guess I'm looking at it from a tech lens. If you have a bunch of mobile engineers, it probably was pretty big. And then it's just been on the agenda, on the agenda, on the agenda, data, data, data. But it hasn't been fundamentally transformation. People just call it that. There's like an unending number of transformation projects. Whereas now with AI, it's actual transformation. And it's life or death again. And it's the same as the internet. And so I feel like we should have digital transformation and real digital transformation (laughs) when we're talking about these. The wave of digitization is all off the back of the internet in some form. And most digital transformation, when people talk about it, is always in relation to big companies that are super slow moving, that have been around forever, that need to digitally transform. (laughs) And that clearly is not the scale of world in which we live, because every scale of company I've ever worked with always tends to be on the front foot in terms of working with the best possible tooling that's available at that point in time. And as a scale-up person, you're just used to that in terms of this whole idea of digital transformation doesn't even like factor into the equation, basically. However, to your point, now AI is a thing for everyone, whether you're a scale-up or whether you're corporate X, and it is going to have an impact on how you figure out how to use it properly within companies is, to your point, like a real transformation that has yet to occur. Well, there's always another thing, isn't there? There's always the next DocuSign, the next yeah. whatever piece. And big businesses are still dealing with paper. All right. So we've got a great topic today, which is what does the future tech CEO look like? And we've got two amazing guests for this. We've got Andrea Severo and Tony Olvet from IDC. Andrea is the research director at IDC and author of the Future CEO and Tech Companies white paper. And Tony is the group vice president and world C-suite and digital business research manager. Before we get to Tony and to Andrea, I just wanted to start with you, Bethany, with the first question that occurred to me out of that interview, which was Tony had talked about 85% of CEO hires were made internally, and 40% of those were coming from the CEO position, which means that the CEO role is used as a conduit and a primer, I guess, for the CEO position in a lot of companies. And we had a podcast where we talked to Cameron Harold, and he had the exact opposite view, which you pointed out, which is typically CEOs don't move into that position. They do the CEO role over and over again for just larger companies and involve their career in that fashion. And it got me thinking, what gap needs to be filled with people at our level where there is an aspiration for a CEO position and that thing that's out there that skill-wise we need to have to be able to make that jump and to make it successfully into being a CEO. Interestingly, I was tagged on a post on LinkedIn today that was about how Steve Jobs was only successful his second time at Apple because he had Tim Cook. And really, it wasn't just about having the vision. It was about getting shit done, making the trains run on time, and yeah. how Apple really needed that. And that's also why Tim's done such a great job. But then in the comments, there were people referencing Tim Cook doesn't have 
a visionary bone in his body. He cares about efficiency, about getting stuff done, about profitability, which has meant that Apple has done tremendously well over the past 10 years or more, but has nothing of interest. We're surprised by AI. The iPhone is the same iPhone with just better battery life for 15 years now. And there's no innovation left. And so I guess just because I had that article the other day and you think about particularly founder CEOs are often being the visionary impetus and all about innovation, COOs don't tend to be that. And so maybe it's more just what does a business need at a certain time rather than a skill that you always need. I think that's actually a great point because I think you're exactly right. I think there's an entrepreneurial person, which I know I'm definitely not. It's a bit of like, what does a business need at a particular point in time? And I suspect in the Tony Olvet kind of numbers that he was laying out there, these are probably much larger organizations that are much more about stabilization, incremental growth, as opposed to entrepreneurial scale-ups in this case. And I suspect also have much more of a real operational logistical component to them, kind of like the Tim Cook situation where there's just like a legitimate kind of like a physical good operational side of the business that's quite significant. The couple of things that I was thinking about was the storytelling capacity, which is that ability to be in a position where whether it's the vision, the mission, the purpose, the strategy, why we're here, why it's tremendously exciting, or taking that same storytelling capability and being able to sell people on it, which is you know new recruits, investors, strategic customers, or the initial batch of customers that you need to win as a founder-led business or something like that, you know, translating storytelling into selling capacity and selling capability. I'm working for a company right now where it's just shown me yet again that the founder-led sales can be so fabulous. You know what I mean? Technically, they don't need to be salespeople, but they express such fluidity in terms of the passion around the product, the vision of the company, why it's tremendously exciting, and can talk about every subtle aspect of why it is like super compelling in a very clear, crisp way. And he's a phenomenal communicator. Whenever I see it, or what we were quite recently seeing it in action, it just made me think that storytelling capacity is such a vital piece of the puzzle. And just reflecting on myself, I recognize that I'm not in that category of storytelling world, so to speak, right? And it's never going to be my shtick. And to your point, there's a time and place for that person. And there's a time and place for people like myself. And they're not at the same point in time. I also think that storytelling is an essential skill for senior leaders and senior execs regardless. And it might not be that it's a vision story, but there have to be some story because you have to get people wanting to do stuff for you and understand why they're doing those things. Even if it's maybe not the most fascinating story, knowing that you start with the punchline, you start at the big picture, frame it for everybody, and then move down into the rest of the argument, I think is still, maybe it's not like a story, but we could call it a narrative, (laughs) which are synonyms of each other, but they do have different emotional feeling. There's almost like the founder-led thing where there's an irrational passion that makes it compelling. It comes from an irrational space that doesn't live within me. (laughs) (laughs) And to your point, being able to create a standard narrative with a standard talk track, with a standard kind of like engagement I feel comfortable or happy doing that kind of thing. And then I reflect on somebody like you where I feel like you're you're in a different space as well. Have you reflected on yourself, I guess, in terms of storytelling capacity? I haven't necessarily reflected on it, but it's good to make me now and also good in preparation for the upcoming episode. I think for me, it comes down to authenticity and the level of gagging myself or not that I'm willing to do. Also, because there's not only the communication on this podcast, other podcasts, but I've been doing a writing course now for about a year and a half. And most of that writing is writing I'm unwilling to share with the world yet. And that has been a massive discovery of my voice and being brave to say what I want to say. And what I've discovered in those classes is it's not just the discovery of my voice, but everybody's voice is it's really interesting to hear people speak from authenticity. And I suspect that that is what makes me an interesting person to listen to rather than a great passion. And I'm willing to say the things that other people are thinking, but aren't brave enough to say. It just makes you feel a little bit less alone. I'm a verbal communicator and makes the world more real to me when I say it out loud. But I was really afraid for a long time 
and I've just become braver over the years, care less about what I might get back and the consequences of what I say and care more about the connection that I make with other people. Sometimes I overshare and I get in trouble, but for the most part, it's okay. You know, but there definitely is an impact, I think, on senior executives where there's a space that people can't enter or they're afraid to enter. Yeah. And there's a lot of polarization <laughs> and there's yeah. a lot of people looking for you to misspeak. The second thing I wanted to ask you was in the conversation that we had with Tony and Andrea, they talked about two new responsibilities for tech CEOs in 2024. One was sustainability and ESG metrics and compliance and et cetera. And they also talked about uh, the second one being unlocking skills in a much more fundamental way and partnering with the people person to make that happen. I'm just wondering on the unlocking skills part as a new responsibility, what's your take on that? Because it feels like in the scale-up space, that's always been somewhat front and center, I think, for CEOs, to be honest, and not really own characterize it as a new responsibility that's kind of fresh out of the box. I was struggling to see that there was anything particularly new in general in the report. I agree with you that unlocking skills and CEOs or COOs is a fundamental part of the job. I guess it points out more to the problem of what is the role of a COO? Is it a back office COO who has finance and people reporting into them? And so by default, working with the people team is important. Increasingly, you have chief people officers. They don't report to the COO, but the COO is still responsible for aligning everyone and creating that operational strategy piece. And chief people officers don't tend to think that way, that you still have somebody who's actually thinking about the people strategy. But yeah, whether it's new for 2024, I question. The SaaS world that we live in really is, in one way, tackling spreadsheets, I would say. <laughs> Anything that's done manually in a spreadsheet at scale is always problematic. So there's many SaaS companies that have popped up over time that really solve that fundamental problem in a, in a particular sphere. So one that was quite interesting to me uh, last year was this career progression framework SaaS software piece. And career progression frameworks as an actual kind of SaaS software is now starting, we're starting to see it pop up within the HRISs as an add-on module, which makes entirely good sense. The fact that it hasn't been there previously is mind-boggling to me. But yes. what I do know is that in the past seven years, having done this many, many times, what we've always ended up doing is creating spreadsheets around the levels, the individual contributor track, the management track, and the values and the competencies you know, et cetera, et cetera. And these spreadsheets that we end up building are enormous in size. They feel like very heavyweight in a lot of ways, I guess. And there's no way around it other than building a proper SaaS tool that can make this easy and simplified and clear, <laughs> I suppose. So I, I'm just curious your experience dealing with these, these frameworks and what your thought is, I guess, with the, the SaaS module add-ons that are now starting to pop up. It's so difficult to find that line between art and science. It, it's such a cliche. In business in general, but there's certain elements that particularly I think when they land in the COO remit can be over-engineered because COOs might possibly have a tendency to over-engineer. I don't know. We like nice logical things and you can engineer the humanity out of stuff right. and actually engineer it to the point that you lose efficiency because it's perfectly architected. It's, it's something that COOs should be aware of and notice in themselves a tendency to over-engineer. And certainly something that I do is take a step back and am I, am I doing too much? Yeah. Am I expecting too much? <laughs> Especially in scaled companies, because you're not trying to solve the world's problems where you're trying to just put a framework in place that is suitable and enough there to make it work. All right, so why don't we move on to our conversation with Tony and Andrea. We are revving up the engine of the podcast and looking for a great brand to sponsor the show. We have over 7,000 listeners now across COOs, CEOs, founders, and operational professionals who are decision makers for all kinds of technology, including HR, planning, strategy, legal, and other tools. It's Beth here. I just wanted to thank you for listening to the podcast, and we'd love to keep it going, but we're going to need to get some sponsors in order to do that. So if you work at a company that could benefit from speaking to listeners like you or know of a company that might benefit, please send them our way. To find out more, go to operationsroom.co slash sponsorship. That is operationsroom.co slash sponsorship.
Speaking more broadly, what are the priorities for COOs in 2024 that you found from your research? Yeah, so we do uh, an annual CEO and C-suite survey. And in the C-suite survey, we break it down by roles. And when we look at what COOs told us, the top business objective for this year is supporting the digital transformation of the organization. You know, I take a pause and think about that and also consider, well, is that not also the CIO role or objective? And to me, there is a partnership that needs to happen there. And the chief operating officer needs to think more strategically, not technology first, and also be a partner to the CEO. And I think that's what's driving some of that, but also the fact that there's so much change happening in organizations, most recently led by the explosion in interest and implementation of use cases around generative AI, that there needs to also be a kind of a second steady hand looking at that and considering the organizational impacts as well as the business model impacts. And I think that's what the COO can bring to the strategy and the, and the discussion. The reality is that uh, what Tony was describing is the fact that the product and the digital element or the business and digital, they are not separated anymore. And that's the reality. No, that's the new thing. They are the same thing, which means the women looking behind the digital or the business, they need to be connected more and more and they need to work together. So that's also what we are anticipating, spoiling what, uh, and this is one other point also with Brandon, we were discussing on how, how CEO need to be more and more connected with the rest of the C-suite and the other kind of CXO persona. One other uh, area to think about is in terms of what's different here. And, you know, for Bethany and myself, we're CEOs in scale-up companies, and that's the ecosystem in which we live. And I guess what I'm curious about coming from your background or the both of you is you talk to a lot of CEOs that are much larger corporate companies, and I always get the sense of somehow maybe we're missing a trick in the tech scale-up world that somehow these bigger CEOs in, in a broader sense have learnings for us that we should be understanding, I suppose. I'm just curious uh, what you make of the difference. I think, Brandon, I think in, in principle, at least what we have seen is that the kind of priorities and also you know, mission trajectory is very similar across the two. So it's more, you know, a kind of the scale of the, of the impact that is very different, very similar in kind of priorities and, uh, and needs also from CEOs. Yeah, I also think to add to that, the COO in a scale-up is the right hand of the CEO and also the first to onboard the next leaders that are important to running the business, right? So the CFO, maybe before that you have a, a VP or a director of finance, but becomes the mentor and the onboarder of the other critical personas to run the company as you grow and scale up. I spend a lot of time thinking about COOs, as you might imagine, and there's so many different flavors and it's, well, are you actually a CFO? Are you actually a CRO? If you're only doing the ops part, are you really a COO? Are you a chief of staff? And for me, it ultimately comes down to whether or not you're the right-hand person to the CEO, regardless of what other elements of the organization that you have, is that you're a capable partner for the CEO. And that's almost, for me, the best definition of what a COO is. I don't know if either of you agree or have found that in the conversations that you've been having. I wanted also maybe to read you one of the quotes that we tracked from our, one of the CEO we interviewed. So Michelle described, uh, so it's coming from BMC, so technology company, was really saying, oh, I am being a CEO in a technology company, like a connective tissue of the entire organization, really accelerating growth and driving innovation and customer success. So I think it was a nice recap that really touches the key point with our you know, connecting element across the organization and then the growth and also the customer focus that, as you said, is part also other kind of CXO uh, persona and function, but for sure for CEO is one of the top priority. And right. also I can understand from your point earlier, Tony, about partnering with CIOs. I feel like all the COO does is partner with everybody. Do you think you still need a CIO and a COO as so much of organizations become digital? I don't even know if digital is the right word. Like digital transformation is always the top priority. And net now with generative AI, it's like the top, top priority. <laughs> 
I do think there needs to be both roles, especially in larger, more complex organizations. The CIO has so much on their plate. Technology is changing so fast that increasingly their span and pressure, you know, the need to ensure governance, um, manage cybersecurity with a chief security officer, that role I don't think is going to go away. It's funny though, 20, 25 years ago, there was a, a controversial piece written saying that, you know, the CIO was going to go away. And there was like an existential crisis in that role or function. And CIOs were looking at each other saying, is this true? We need to justify our jobs. And today it's absolutely fundamental. But we are also seeing the fact that in our CEO survey that we just f- finished in February, we asked for the first time, what path did you take to become the leader of the organization? 85% came from inside, 15% came from outside. The number one role from inside was the COO path to CEO. It was 40%. Um, That percentage was actually quite high and much higher than any other role, including CFO or CIO. My follow-on question is, have they been successful CEOs? Or you know, how long have they been in, in tenure? Did you look at that? We did not look at that. So it's something we should dig into. But, you know, I've seen it anecdotally or even IDC's president, his prior role was COO for a short period of time. So it was like a stepping stone. And we've seen that in other organizations. Andrea, I don't know if you've looked at the success rate. I think we, we try at least to really draw a kind of uh, horizon evolution of the future CEO, no? like we had in the title of uh, our report. Traditionally, we come from a scenario where CEOs are really like considered like the kind of operation, as you said, kind of protector. So the focus is really on granting like all the procurement, a seamless flow, and even even all the kind of supplier ecosystem resiliency. That's the kind of standard kind of CEO. In that case, no key KPIs for such a key, such a CEO is really about value chain reliability, value chain cycle time. But then as we evolve in this uh, CEO maturity in the future and the kind of next horizon really, first of all, to become an enabler. An enabler of what? Enabler of uh, different units in the organization exchange and connection. So that's kind of orchestrator we were referring to. And really also an enabler of uh, workforce skills, talent, capability evolution. So that's the kind of second horizon. But then the ultimate, I think, uh, horizon for a CEO is what we call this kind of digital business disruptor, which is really, you know, a CEO that fully master this, you know, disruptor and enable role. But on top of that, is also able to work more and more on digital business models, digital revenue generation, also linking to all the ESG topic that we see more and more top of CEO of the future agenda. And finally, also, you know, that kind of orchestrator element that we were referring to internally, also externally. So me more also more and more a kind of partner, connector, when we say partner is you know, on the supply chain side, but also on the, also on the delivery, on the, on the selling approach, but also, you know, connecting more and more with the customer kind of ecosystem, which is another key element. So different stages. But uh, I think now the CEO that is able to master all of these elements, I think is a very good candidate to become a CEO in the future. Out of that spectrum that you just described there in terms of those functional responsibilities for a CEO, which one is the hottest one this year in terms of it really has come forward as like a clear new function responsibility for the CEO in 2024? And I guess the tail end of that same question is really how are they being held to account on that particular new area, as it were? Sometimes, you know, when we talk about this persona kind of story, we are very focused on the fact, okay, this is CFO, this is CEO. But we need to realize that many topics like ESG, for example, like customer success, they actually, they really the, the final result of the connection, different kind of units and role working together. You know? Top of mind issues that is facing CEOs that I think COOs can help with this year is the notion of responsible AI, especially in a tech company. And so, you know, the vast majority of CEOs told us in the survey that it's either a top priority for themselves or the organization as a whole. Not a big surprise. And we're going back to the CIO, COO debate again, not debate, but clarification of roles and responsibilities. Do you know what the purchasing committees are looking like? 
who holds the budget. So I give you two, maybe first of all, starting point here. So first of all, we live in a world now where actually, if you look, uh, we have our IDC line of business spending guide, where actually we look at the overall digital IT spending and we look who, who are the person behind that, who put the money on the table, no? So I can tell you now, we are really living in a scenario where it's a 50-50 scenario. I think last year has been the first year where business persona, so when I say business persona, I say all those kind of persona outside the IT department, so not CIO, not CISO, not CTO, Chief Digital Office, all the other, all the business persona. Last year was the first year where these persona altogether overcome the IT department persona in terms of uh, digital spending budget control. The other aspect, in it, you can see, again, it's uh, changed a lot. We are getting back again to the point on the industry element, even within, for example, the technology industry. So you need to consider this industry variation. Going back to the industry lens, the COO is going to be an important part of the buying committee or buying center for, you know, if we go back to manufacturing, some of the supply chain and operational technology. I think mainline enterprises, there will be orchestration function that the CIO and the IT team plays increasingly to help guide some of the other lines of business and C-suite personas in terms of ensuring that you know they're thinking about compliance, they're thinking about privacy, security, all of that as they're making their own domain-specific decisions about you know what marketing tech apps we need to bring on board. Is it going to work within their cloud architecture? There's a lot of decisions that are technical that the CIO needs to be involved in, but the COO should have that um, responsibility, f- especially for operational technology or you know, shop floor technology in manufacturers. Oh, because Gen AI is going to be so much of that technology. Yeah, really. absolutely. And other types of AI. Computer vision has been used for you know, years in manufacturing for quality control. People are coming back to, to IDC saying, is is traditional or old AI dead? And it's like, no. It's not going away. In fact, what we're going to see are use cases where you bring you know, predictive AI together with generative AI for better outcomes. The two key differences where we saw CEO, you know, prioritizing specific technology with respect to other C-suite are two main kinds of technologies. So the first one, it was about this uh, direct to consumer platform. And this is very linked to the, you know, so the engagement of CEO with the direct uh, kind of customer at the end. So platform that enable the customer interaction and the contact with the customer on one side. So very, in particular, you know, like uh, much more than the rest of the C-suite. And then the other kind of technology area that CEO are prioritizing is really about all those kind of ESG, sustainability related solution and digital tools. And again, we see that in particular in the COO area, not only, but uh, we expect the C-suite and uh, you know, COO is really pushing on those kind of area and technologies. So we've talked a lot about uh, Gen, AI, Gen AI landing on the plate of the CEO for change transformation for organizations right now. Is sustainability kind of the same thing? So sustainability is an actual thing to be done within an organization. Is it pretty clearly landing on the plate of the CEO to pick up to do something with as a change initiative? I think it, it is really important. And it shows up as uh, one of the top priorities for COOs. And a lot of it will have to do with compliance regulatory uh, reporting requirements. Some of those already in place in Europe since 2023. The SEC now is mandating new reporting requirements as of March, 2023. That's when it was announced. So there is going to be that internal audit process, if you will, and, and understanding not only just climate, but other ESG concerns and thinking about even how employees or how the infrastructure that you're using is going to impact the environment. And it's becoming even more important, again, not to make everything about Gen AI, but the the power consumption and resource requirements of Gen AI is an order of magnitude higher than for, say, a traditional search. So that needs to be considered as well. And the CEO should have a viewpoint on that and be able to contribute to that reporting. And so that's very much around the environment, but I also hear you talk a little bit around the social, as you mentioned that. And so what types of tools, are, we, are they looking internally socially or supply chain social? And if internally social, what are the 
tech, the people tools that you're seeing coming up or new technologies being used? Many times when we talk about ESG, it's all about the E, the environmental aspect, and just a few person remember about the S. So, and why also maybe the reason why not many people talk about that? Because the S is a very different, difficult, you know, kind of uh, topic, the social impact to define, but then also to measure. It's very complicated, you know. When normally when we talk about the social impact organization, even before, you know, talking about tool, it's really about uh, the overall kind of organizational culture and link and how, you know, organization work to, to really have a, a, a full social impact, which means, you know, pushing on uh, volunteering, give back activity, for example. It's also about, you know, how an organization, how much, for example, jobs you generate and how much overall economy kind of GDP growth you create. So it's quite vast as a topic. I think uh, in terms of tool, is a very new kind of market, the kind of digital tool for social impact. There is, but you, you might know first of all that there is all uh, uh, this kind of what we call digital for good kind of market that are all those solutions done really focused on uh, enabling organization to have uh, a good social impact. You might have seen that, for example, if you look at, uh, you know, retailer that they say now, you know, if you buy this, 1% of what you buy will be donated to this organization. It's very interesting because behind that kind of donation as part of your purchase, there is a full digital market that is, is growing, which is having platform that enable that 1% donation, but not only enable, also check the donation, make sure that where it goes, how it goes, is trusted. It's a very interesting topic, but there are actually you know, many tools that really make it possible somehow. So we talked about the CO classically being groomed for the CEO position, having the right skills to make that jump. And we also have kind of talked about the CEO being kind of a linchpin for change transformation across organizations, partnering ad nauseum with other senior executives to, to make that happen. So when you think about the skills of the CEO and how that's evolving, how that has evolved, I guess, over the past several years, what's your take on that? I like the work that Andrea, you and the team did around you know, the future tech COO and that pyramid growing from the protector to the enabler to the disruptor COO. And I thought that was a, a really good model to think about. And within that, you can also see the progression of what they're focused on, the different KPIs. And within that, there will have to be skills development. And, you know, one of the things, Brandon, you talked about and when you we're discussing the, the skills of the COO is not everyone has the same skill set or background or experience. So having what you term that, that spike. So the core differentiator is you as a leader, you need to bring that forward to drive success. And I think it's going to be different depending on the individual, but it's also going to be different depending on where the company is in its journey. So Andrea, if you want to explore or talk a little bit more about that model and the protector, enabler, and disruptor, I think that might be useful. Well, you know, protector really focus more on all the resiliency of the organization, avoiding supply chain shocks somehow, and then moving to that enabler that is really focusing on, uh, you know, exchange across unit, also work for evolution. And finally, the kind of disruptor where really, again, the key word for a disruptor CEO is really that kind of digital business disruption, which means creating new revenue model, new revenue stream, but also linking that to ESG kind of impact. So these are the three kind of stages and maturity layer. That we see. I guess just from everything that you've been talking about and the skills that are required, it doesn't sound very different than it ever has. Was there anything that you were surprised about? Is there any new news? Because really everything that we've been talking about is like, yeah, we all need these skills. I think one skill set that is increasingly important and Bethany and Brandon, maybe you would argue that the, this has always been there, but I think it's that communication skills and ability to motivate through difficult change. I think it's even more important now with just the pace of change and the introduction of generative AI and other new technologies into the business where you need to be able to make sure that employees feel comfortable and the direction that they're going, but also open their eyes to the fact that change is going to happen and that there are other skills that you need to bring to your own career 
and we'll help you with that, but you also have to be motivated for that change. From everything that we've spoken about today, if our audience could only remember and do one thing, what would it be? As a CEO, you need to be ready for the unexpected. You know, dedicate 70% of your time to all your expected traditional tasks, but then make sure you block 30%. So it was very scientific and mathematical. 30% of your time for all the unexpected and more difficult kind of events that can be on your table. But I think that the mentality and the G to be ready for, you know, thing that you cannot always control or maybe are a bit unexpected is something that I think CEO in particular, but also we all can leverage and benefit from. Interesting that learning, researching, getting better at the craft, is there's no space for that? Or is that wonder if that's yeah, like 70%? Yes. I think, yeah, I think, I think that should be part of the 70%. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Just like BAU plus firefighting. Yeah. <laughs> it just kind of reminds me of the Google thing. So instead of spending 30% of your time innovating, you're spending 30% um, of your time firefighting. So it sounds very <laughs> operations focused, which uh, makes sense. And Tony, what would you like to share? I think the one thing that every CEO, especially in the tech industry, needs to think about is being able to paint the picture of the future state of the organization and be able to communicate that clearly to the employees, but also to the customers. To end Andrea's point, to expect that there will be an unexpected event, right? So you'll always have to adjust and course correct, but being able to communicate that clearly, this is where we plan to go and this is what it means to you. I think that's so important and it will be a, a powerful driver of change within the organization. Lovely. So thank you, Tony and Andrea, for joining us on the operations room. If you like what you hear, please uh, leave a comment or subscribe and we will see you next week.